So hello, my name is James Bowen. I'm a uh, second year PhD student at the University of Bristol. So what I kind of want to talk to you about today is the journey I've got to where I am as a PhD student. So how I got there, what I've done so far, and kind of encourage you to do chemistry and explain why it is such a great degree and what opportunity it offers you. And then I also want to just give a brief overview of the research I do, the importance of it, and also aspects of Bristol as a university. So just giving you a idea of where I've come from and what I've done. So around 24 years ago, I was born in High Wycombe, which is in the Chilton Hills. It's a home of High Wycombe, uh, Wycombe Wanderers, great football team. Uh, it's famous for its chairs. And it's a beautiful area. The Chilton Hills are amazing, even though some people would say that High Wycombe itself isn't so great. So I went to school at uh, the RGS High Wycombe, where I studied for my A-levels, maths, further maths, physics, uh, chemistry and economics. And when I completed my A-levels, I was kind of uncertain exactly what I wanted to do. But I did know that I loved studying. Um, I'm quite an inquisitive person. And so I decided that I wanted to go to university and in particular I wanted to study chemistry um, because it kind of allows you to be inquisitive. It's kind of the whole point of the subject. So I decided to uh, go to Birmingham for my university degree. And some of you might already be thinking, oh, why Birmingham? It's not exactly the nicest looking city. And I would actually disagree with you there. The campus itself is beautiful. Um, one of the best campuses I've seen. And the city is really vibrant, um, quite youthful as well. Great, uh, great everything to do, nightlife, uh, culture, even though on the face of it, people always say it's a grey industrial city. So um, don't agree with them there. So I just now kind of give you an idea of what the university or what my university uh, life was like. So I did a uh, four year MSI course, which is a Master of Science in Chemistry of Industrial Experience. Yeah, in the first two years, uh, I was studying core chemistry, and this is common for um, four year chemistry courses. So this is really understanding the basic principles of the science. In my third year, then I took a year out to do an industry placement at a pharmaceutical and healthcare company called GSK, which you might have heard of. Uh, and this I'll talk about a bit more in detail later, but I would really recommend doing this if you get the opportunity, uh, taking time of your university career to actually um, work in a company can really give you some great experience uh, and make your future kind of uh, better in terms of getting a, getting a job. Uh, and then so I came back in my final year, so my fourth year to do um, an experimental research project. So as well as my learning, I was also uh, conducting novel research, which is quite exciting in itself, doing things that no one else has done before. And then 2018, so two years ago, I graduated. So why did I choose chemistry and why do I think you or other people should choose chemistry? So firstly, chemistry is actually everywhere um, from everything you do. And you notice this a lot. You start to understand the world around you when simple things happen, such as um, when things are happening in cooking, when solids are dissolving, just uh, the use of cleaning chemicals. It's just really interesting uh, if you're a bit of a nerd like me to understand these sort of things. Uh, you also get to work on some really rewarding projects. And I think this is a really important point. Chemistry is at the forefront of everything we do, um, whether that be for uh, creating green technologies, which is definitely important going forward, uh, and new pharmaceutical drugs, which obviously is important for the healthcare of the world. But it does actually, it's not just something that's rewarding. It does give you the opportunity to work in any way you want. It doesn't have, just have to be chemistry. So the skills you gain from doing a chemistry degree uh, you can translate them to any other um, walk of life. So it doesn't just stop you for it doesn't just mean that you have to go into chemistry. And this is one of the kind of key points that I chose when choosing, uh, decided on when choosing chemistry is that I didn't want to limit my options for my jobs afterwards. And that it, chemistry certainly does not do that. And uh, I assume most people will agree with this. I definitely do. And it's actually really fun. Um, it's a really fun degree to do, especially because there's a lot of practical aspects to it. So you're not just sat around working on a computer or in lectures all the time. So I talked about all the different skills uh, just briefly before, and there are so many. There's a plethora of different skills that you gain from doing a degree in chemistry. Um, so practical skills is one that I actually really enjoy doing. Lab work is really fun. 
but you also get things like problem solving and teamwork which are really really important in any any sort of job that you want to go into and that's why a lot of people who do chemistry do go into things like banking economics as well as teaching so just back to my journey so where I was, I was at university at Birmingham. So I spent my first two years there, um, basically loving it. And then I went for my uh, year in industry. So for that, I went to GSK, which is based in Stevenage. And so for those of you who thought that um, Birmingham is a bit of a gloomy place, Stevenage is also um, viewed that way. And this one I would agree with a little bit more. Uh, so these are the uh, nicest pictures I could find of Stevenage. Um, but actually, it was probably the most rewarding and best year of my university life. And that is because working at GSK was such a valuable experience and it was a lot of fun. So as a student there, I was actually straight away involved in working in projects that um, were really important to the company. I wasn't just there as sort of like just a, an extra an extra wheel that they didn't need. So I was working on developing a new drug for um, respiratory diseases and that this was a lab based um, project where basically I was in the lab every day in nine to five job uh, gaining so much experience and learning from people who have been in the field for a long time um, state-of-the-art facilities as well um, not only that there are a lot of other students there so GSK itself takes on about 150 students each year so it's it's quite a fun environment to be in as well and the skills I learned in my third year uh, both in, in the employment world and also in chemistry have been so valuable going forward ever since. And the connections I've made are still proving to be important to this day. So if you do get the opportunity, I would recommend going for a course uh, at university that allows you to spend some time working at a company. And also importantly to note that you do actually get paid for this work as well. You're not doing it for free. So it does help to pay towards your, tu um, your living and tuition at the university, which for me was very important. So after my third year, I uh, went back to Birmingham for my final year, where this time, as I said, I was doing an independent research project. So this was the first time, rather than just learning at university in my first two years, I was actually applying the knowledge to uh, do novel research and then push the boundaries. So basically starting to understand things that no people haven't understood before and creating a bigger knowledge pool and this for me was really exciting because I was no longer just learning knowledge I was creating it and for someone who is inquisitive uh, this is just a really exciting experience because you get to share this with other people and say oh look at this interesting thing I found out obviously it's it is quite hard work and quite challenging at times but that is also part of the enjoyment and because it's at a university there's a lot of young people around and it's just a really exciting environment to be in so at that point, I graduated from the university and I was, again, uncertain of what I wanted to do. And I think that's something that you'll experience all the time in life, but that's fine. You just make a decision and stick with it. And it's quite exciting. So I knew that I loved chemistry and I wanted to carry on doing things in chemistry. Uh, so my options really in that case were to go back into work at somewhere like GSK, which was really enjoyable, or perhaps then do what I'm doing, which is a PhD. And this is what I ended up deciding to do, and I'll kind of discuss the reasons for that later. But that's where I am now in Bristol. And so this is the first time I can say for certain that Bristol is a beautiful city and everyone who comes there always loves it. If you haven't been, I strongly recommend coming to visit. It's a great place as well for a holiday. There's loads of uh, areas you can walk around, not just inside Bristol, but just outside. You can also go visit places like Bath. So, yeah, strongly recommend. And the university itself is world leading, um, especially in chemistry, but in other areas as well. Um, and I'll go to talk about that a bit more as well. So I know when I was at school, um, I, I knew about PhD, but I didn't understand it. I didn't really know what it was. So um, if you do, I'm sorry, but I'll just go through kind of what a PhD is and my view of a PhD and the journey you can go to get there. So you'll be at school doing uh, your final qualifications and at this stage you can either go into employment or you can decide to um, go to university where you can do what's known as a bachelor's degree so this is uh, generally three years um, of study and then you can continue this further to do a master's degree which is one or two years on top of that or you can do what I did which is known as an um, integrated master's 
which is a four year degree. And this is where you basically start straight away on a master's course. And I myself found this really useful because then you have a clear path of what you're doing, but you can always drop back to a, a bachelor's degree if you decide that you don't want to continue with a master's degree. And from any stage there, you can go back into employment as well. Or you can do the next step, which I've moved on to, which is a PhD. So I'm two years into my PhD now, so about halfway. And then when you finish your PhD, you can again go back into employment or go further and to carry on doing research at university as a postdoctoral researcher or a postdoc. And these generally last one to years, but some people carry on for as much as five to ten years. Um, it just depends what you want to do at this point. And again, you can go back into employment or then you can move on to what's known as professor. And that's when you're starting to leave research and kind of be the, the big boss. And I should have drawn another arrow realistically back from professor to employment, because at that stage, you can also, if you want, and this is quite a common thing, go back into employment with all the skills you've learned as a researcher. And I've just said employment vaguely here, but realistically, there's so much you can do. So if, uh, as a chemist, you can go into drug development, be a food scientist, but then you don't actually have to do anything related to um, chemistry. So you can be a nuclear engineer, a teacher, you can go into banking, or you can become a patent lawyer, for example. So use your knowledge of chemistry to um, be a patent lawyer. And this is something that a lot of people do and I've considered myself. Okay, so a bit more specific about what a PhD is. So they're generally three to four years, um, depending on the exact uh, PhD course you're on. And they are very research specific. So rather than learning a broad range of information that you've uh, probably previously done probably at school or university, being a bit more narrowed in one um, area, such as chemistry, you're really digging down into the uh, gritty detail of that area that you're researching. And this is quite exciting because obviously not many people around the world will be looking into the particular area you are, or maybe no one. So you can really say for the first time, you might be a world leader in the area you're looking at. Uh, they are quite long PhDs, so generally three to four years. That's in the UK at least. I know in America they can last up to seven years. but they are really rewarding and actually I'm two years in now and it's going a lot quicker than I thought. Um, it just really goes. But it is important to remember you do get paid for this. It's not like university. This is different now. You are a paid researcher. So that actually helps towards why doing it. It's not like you're having to pay for this um, education as well because you are getting educated at the same time. And then a lot of people like it at the end of the three to four years, you actually get to become a doctor. Um, and unlike a medical doctor, if you stop practicing medicine, then you can no longer use the doctor title. However, as a PhD, you can always can, um, keep your doctor title. You're a doctor for life, if that makes a difference to anyone. <laughs> OK, so my PhD group, I kind of give you an overview of what it is like working in the group that I work in. It's the structure of it. So as I said, you can you have PhD students postdoctoral researchers and professors. So in my group, my professor is Chris Willis. So she's kind of my boss. Um, and then from there, we have three postdoctoral researchers. And then there is 12 PhD students at various stages of the of our careers. And you'll notice so in general, it's quite a young group. So we work in an office and a lab all together and it's quite a um, excitable and high energy environment. Uh, especially that's always the case at university, uh, which kind of makes it a lot more interesting. There's a lot going on and you're always talking and it's an exciting place to work, basically. Um, it really keeps you going into work, especially when you're having a bad day. OK, so what is it like actually doing a PhD? What am I doing day to day? So I'll kind of give you my experience. It's obviously different for everyone else or different to what um, degree you go into. But I'm generally talking about chemistry here. so. What I do every day, I come in, I'll do a little bit in the office, but then I'm generally just working in the lab. So I'm doing lab work on my individual project. Um, everyone else in the lab will be doing their own things and uh, just kind of understanding what I'm doing day to day. And the really good bit for me is that I get to choose what direction I take my project. So if you're working in a company, often they have their own goals and there's certain things that they want to achieve. So kind of you have tasks that you are meant to achieve directed for you. 
but as a PhD student doing research, you really do get to choose where you take your project. Obviously, your supervisor is there to guide you, but at the end of the day, it's your work. So you get complete control over it. And as, as a result, you have a sense of ownership. You have a sense of this is what I have understood. This is what I have learned and this is what I have made, basically, which is really rewarding, especially when you've been doing it for a long, long amount of time. Um, What's good is then you start to be able to, as you progress, you start to aim to publish your work in scientific journals. And this is basically a way of disseminating the work that you have understood. And this is basically the point of science. You understand something and then you uh, disseminate it to the rest of the world. And this is really exciting as well, because you are for the first time showing people a new piece of information that they might have not known. And you are, as I said, a world leader in that area. And so you, not only can you publish this work in scientific journals, you can go to conferences all around the world. Um, some of them, for example, are in Hawaii, which is really exciting, doing um, presentations near the beach. And at these, at these conferences, you are, again, presenting your work as a world leader to other world leaders. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it can be really fun and really rewarding as well. OK, so here's just a picture of the lab that I work in. Uh, this, some people might say is dirty, but this is probably the cleanest you will see our lab. And actually, as labs go, it is pretty clean for somewhere that you're working on all the time. And there's uh, a lot of equipment in here, a lot of chemicals. Uh, and here is a, the fume hood that I work in. So obviously, chemistry is a practical, um, practical uh, research degree. And as a result, there are particular hazards involved in that. And so we have these things called fume hoods, which we do majority of our work in just to protect us from any particular uh, chemicals which we're using. And again, uh, Bristol, uh, working at Bristol is, um, we're very fortunate that they have a lot of like state of the art technology. And in particular, we have a lot of space in our labs. So it, while some universities you're expected to share a fume hood like this, which obviously is quite uh, demanding on space, especially if you're both working there a lot of time, I'm lucky enough that I have one of these to myself, so you kind of get to arrange it how you want and use it when you want. So there's another plus side for Bristol. So uh, outside of just the research you're doing, you also get given lectures from world leading chemists, like I mentioned in the conferences. Uh, for example, one just last year, we had a Nobel Prize winner, Ben Feringa, who's just shown at the bottom left, come to give a talk. And it was a really exciting day. Obviously, he's telling us everything um, about his experiences and um, really exciting yeah uh, you also get to go on courses so when just because you're no longer doing an undergraduate degree does not mean that you're not still learning so uh, that bristol offers loads and loads of uh, courses for transferable skills uh, it skills as well uh, so things like coding and um, computing which is obviously very important going forward so you keep as a phd student learning you're not just stagnating you're not just now working and on the treadmill you're really developing yourself still and as I mentioned before, Bristol, as it is a world leading uh, university, has so much uh, modern and um, state of the art equipment. So, for example, these two pictures just demonstrate some of our analytical equipment, where in them alone, there's um, tens of millions of pounds worth of equipment, which you obviously would not have access to um, if you weren't at a lot top in universities such as Bristol, which really makes um, your work easier. OK, so again, other things that you get to do as a PhD student, um, you get to start supervising people. So as you go through university, you are often supervised by people in the lab. When you're a master's student, you're supervised by PhD students. So when you become a PhD student, you then get to also pass down the knowledge you've learned all the time and supervise other students in the lab. So uh, last year I supervised two, two master's students. And this is a lot of fun, obviously, because they are really willing to learn and you get to um, get to know them really well. And it's actually uh, quite a lot of fun to be able to um, help them to kind of start their journey in research. Another thing, you really do get to actually start the teaching of undergraduate students. So last year I was teaching first year undergraduate students. So just as they come out of school and college. And if you didn't know, uh, as I said, a lot of chemistry is practical. So a lot of the work you do when you're uh, as an undergraduate is, for example, lab work, which is the best bit about chemistry, really. Whilst other um, courses, you're kind of 
uh, writing notes and lectures all the time. Chemistry, you're quite often in the lab. And for these labs, you have demonstrators who will uh, help you to learn skills. And so this is a really rewarding experience as someone who's gone through the process to actually be able to pass that knowledge back down to the students who are currently going through it. And then you also get to do things like this. So obviously this is just a um, presentation, but you get there's various other outreach activities which are basically encouraging you students and um, to uh, take a PhD, uh, take a bit PhD um, or take a chemistry degree and really show the importance of chemistry, which is, again, I find really important because we need to encourage more people to um, go into science and chemistry in particular, because it is such an important and enjoyable um, route. OK, so now I've kind of discussed what a PhD is, I kind of want to go into more detail on what my PhD is and the group, the general research interests of the group that I'm in, which is, as I said, um, under the supervision of Chris Willis. So her research over the years has generally been looking into natural products. So these are molecules that are made in nature and in particular by uh, bacterial and funguses. So nature is often a source of um, inspiration for drugs. So the molecules that we've been looking at in particular over the years, so the maleodrides at the top, pleuromutilin in the middle and then mipiracin at the bottom. And these have been shown to have uh, potent activities and what we've been looking at is how they are synthesized in nature so how are they biosynthesized and importantly to use this to understand how we might be able to generate these molecules or analogs of these molecules to make better drugs so like i said nature is often a real source of inspiration for drugs and this is evident from these three in particular aspirin penicillin and morphine which are isolated from natural products of um, for trees bacteria and, for example, poppy seeds. And this really demonstrates how nature is really, really good at developing drugs and actually way better than us. So we should use nature as a source of inspiration for developing these drugs. So I just want to talk about my research, which is based on developing and understanding the um, mechanism of a uh, antifungal medication. And why is this important? Obviously, in the time we're in at the moment, where bacterial resistance is becoming a big problem, and actually with uh, the coronavirus currently, um, we're looking at needing new uh, treatments for viruses. But actually, there is a m massive emerging fungal problem. And this is being exacerbated by the fact that there is global warming. And global warming is proposed to bring new fungal diseases for mammals, as well as plants, to areas that they haven't been before, which is obviously quite scary because if we if you haven't seen it before, it might um, we might struggle to defend against it. So as you can see, the um, cases for plant infecting fungi and animal infecting fungi are on the rise, and this can have an issues with health as well as uh, food crop production, which will then will make it difficult to feed people around the world. And this was quite an interesting one that I found a piece of information that majority of the species which are coming extinct are a result of fungi rather than um, what you'd expect to be viruses or bacteria or others, uh, other diseases. And for an example of this is this uh, frogling fungus from 2018, which was supposed to kill around 138 species of frog, uh, which is massive when you think about it. So we do really need to kind of start coming up with new fungal medicines, uh, antifungal med medicines to deal with this problem, because currently we do not have that many. So one potential avenue for this uh, is natural products, like I said. So Ambrotycin S is a molecule that I've been looking into, which was derived by a um, derived from a bacteria, so a gliding bacterium known as Polyangium cellulosum. Of course, they're all named in Latin, these. <laughs> uh, and it was shown to have really high activity against many common fungal pathogens. And importantly, it showed no toxicity when tested in mammals. And this is really important for a drug. Obviously, you don't want to be giving something that's going to make the patient sicker because it's toxic to them. Because then what's the point in treating them with it if you're just doing more damage? So ambrotycin is quite a complex molecule compared to something like aspirin, for example. And there's many functional groups present. So if you want, if you want to just pause the video at this point and just have a go at naming some of the functional groups that are present in ambrotycin, just to kind of test yourself, feel free. 
uh, and then I'll just kind of highlight them in a second. Okay, so if you had a go at them, here is just some of them highlighted, uh, the simplified uh, functional groups, so you've got carboxylic acids, uh, many alkenes, cyclopropane, which is a three-membered ring, you've got ethers, and then alcohols as well. So it's a very complex molecule, and it's important sometimes to identify these functional groups in molecule, because then you can understand maybe how you might synthesize it, or how it might interact um, as a drug. Okay, so as I said, we are interested in understanding, as re my research, in understanding how ambrotycin is biosynthesized, because from this we can maybe learn lessons on how we can do synthesis better, so how we can make it, or how we can generate analogs of ambrotycin to make a better drug. So the general biosynthesis of ambrotycin I won't go through, but you basically start from a very simple precursor and then it's built up, kind of in a chain extension, to this thing called ambrotycin J. And then what I'm interested in is how ambrotrycin A is transformed into ambrotrycin F. So you've got gone from this diol to a diol with this um, cyclic ether, which is the carbon oxygen carbon bond, which is an ether. And this appears to be catalyzed by an enzyme known as AMBJ, which I'll talk about in a second. And then you get a further step catalyzed by enzymes again, which turns the alcohol into this ketone, which is an oxidation and then a subsequent reduction, which turns the alcohol, uh, which turns the ketone back into the alcohol. So I mentioned um, AMBJ was an enzyme. So for those who aren't um, familiar with enzymes, or just want reminding, enzymes are biological catalysts, where catalysts are species that speed up chemical reactions in living things. And this allows a reaction that wouldn't previously occur or occur very slowly to happen much more rapidly. And enzymes, you find them everywhere. Catalysts, you find them everywhere. But enzymes in biological systems, you find them everywhere. And they are what help us live. And so they're often described as a lock and key, um, where you've got your substrate coming in. It then interacts with the enzyme, causes a reaction to happen, and then you get your product formed. And this appears to be what's happening in the transformation of ambrotycin J into ambrotycin F, where AMBJ is the catalyst, ambrotycin J is the substrate, so initially you seem to get epoxidation with AMBJ of one of the alkenes. This is the insertion of an oxygen into the carbon-carbon double bond, and then a subsequent cyclization to form your cyclic ether, to form this six-membered ring cyclic ether. Alternatively, though, you could propose that a five-membered ring could form by just a slightly different attack onto your epoxide. But this doesn't happen, so we really want to understand why AMBJ is causing this reaction pathway to happen, and then maybe we can even use AMBJ as a catalyst to form similar reactions. And this is important for maybe doing performing some green chemistry. And hopefully by understanding this, we can then move on to our overall aim, which is to generate analogues of ambrotycin, and therefore hopefully improve upon its properties that make it a good drug and therefore develop a new drug that will help fight against fungal infections. So that's kind of the overall aim of what the research I'm doing is, and a lot of that involves um, making analogues, for example. And some of these analogues, as you can do, see, you can change from an alcohol to an amine, remove the cyclopropane, change that right-hand side completely for a benzene, which is the aromatic ring, or then completely cut off the right-hand side, make the molecule a lot smaller and see what happens. So this is kind of what I'm doing as my research, and a lot of that involves just lab work every day, uh, kind of getting a result and then deciding what to do next. But I want to kind of then I'll end by talking about a story how your research can, the research you do as a PhD student can really impact the world and actually really come out with something. So um, there's a U uh, University of Bristol spin-out company called Xylo, which is basically uh, meant for developing new diabetes treatments particularly molecules which bind to glucose in the blood. And in 2018, a deal was struck which was worth more than 800 million, which was a partnership between Xylo and Novo Nordisk. And this was work that actually a PhD student, as well as a supervisor, um, started. And as a result, they have part of, um, part of the company. So this does show how work you do as a PhD student, it isn't small and insignificant. It really can have an impact on quite some big world events. And I find that quite exciting. So just to summarise what I've talked about today, 
I, did, I hope I have inspired you to realize that a degree in chemistry is great and it does not just allow you to do chemistry but opens up many different career opportunities at any point you can stop doing chemistry and use everything you've learned to do a different career and then also just about my research into antifungal resistance and how actually there is a real need to develop new antifungal treatments and um, kind of to come up with a more efficient process in making drugs because this is a slow and expensive process thank you for listening I'm sorry that you can't have any questions on this uh, PowerPoint, but hopefully at some point I'll be able to give you a talk personally and you can ask any questions then. Thank you.